an important differentiation when you're talking about collecting data to make predictions is the difference between sampling variability and sampling bias. Sampling variability is something that happens in any sampling. It's something you just can't avoid. It's just the fact that any group that you pick is going to be different than any other group you pick. And so the results that you get may be different each time. You may uh, collect a group of 10 people and find the average height is 5'10". Then you may inter uh, collect a different group of people and find that the average is 5'9", right? There's just some natural uh, variations in the groups that you pick. And uh, that's going to show and make a difference in terms of getting different results in a repeatability uh, situation. Sampling bias, however, is something that is part of the design that makes it so that the results that you're getting are different than what ends up being true for the big population. Um, it might be intentional. It might be unintentional. It might be be for good reasons or for bad reasons, but whatever, something in the way that, that you're collecting the data makes it so that you end up with a non-representative group in your sample. This leads to one of statistics more popular sayings, garbage in, garbage out. If you're collecting data in a biased way, in a way that's not representative of the population in some fashion or another, then we're putting garbage in. And it doesn't matter what how good we are at our calculations. If we're using data that's not representative, our results mean nothing. So it's really, really critical as you're designing any sort of collection method. Um, this is why, for example, we like random uh, simple random samples as the gold standard, right? Because there's no, no chance for any bias. Everybody's in there. Everybody has a chance of being included. There are, uh, so sampling bias is this big category of uh, having some sort of an issue with the way that something is designed um, to, that, that makes it so your sample isn't representative. There are a few different types of things that are really common. Um, mistakes that people make when collecting data. So we're going to identify uh, some of these specific types of sampling bias and think of some examples of how things would go along with them. One of the biggest problems that we have is, or the types of bias that we can introduce is something called voluntary response bias. What, what, when does voluntary response bias happen? It usually happens, um, or it happens when the researchers um, ask for volunteers. To participate. So what's happening here is you are asking other people to, to um, participate in the survey, and but you're just throwing it out there, right? Um, so why does this cause problems? Well, think of, uh, for example, maybe like some of those American Idol type of shows, right? Where you're supposed to call in for your favorite person or call in for who you want to vote off the island or whatever. Generally, when we're asking people to call in, for something, we end up getting people that are on the extremes. They either really, really, really like something or they really, really, really hate something. And so we end up with a kind of a split that's not representative of what's going on. We kind of miss those middle opinions when we ask for volunteers to participate in opinion types of surveys. Um, and that gives you not really a good picture of what's going on with the population as a whole. It gets you this extreme look. Um, we also run into a voluntary response bias, even in things like medical surveys. Think people, things that people volunteer for, there are certain types of people who regularly volunteer. And so there are certain 
that there end up being more like comparisons between people that would be willing to volunteer with the general population. So in either of those cases, we end up with a, a situation where we're collecting bias data and um, it's not really very valuable. A lot of convenience sampling falls into this voluntary response bias. For example, if I put out, um, uh, you know, participate in my Facebook survey, um, or, you know, you're reading a magazine and it's like mail this survey in for response, you're only getting volunteers that are coming by. Even something as simple as setting up a booth in the mall and waiting for people to come up and talk to you, you're just getting certain types of people to come and talk to you. Um, and you miss the busy ones or the you know the people with little kids or things that would differentiate them from the general population. You end up missing entire groups in your survey, um, which ends up giving you a non-representative result and not good data. Another common type of response uh, or of, of sampling bias is called self is called a self-interest study. A self-interest study isn't just because I'm doing this survey because I'm interested in it. That's not what we're talking about. Self-interest is that there's a personal impact or interest For the researcher in the outcome. So this is self-interest means that, and usually what this personal impact or interest is going to be, is going to be related to money. So let's say, you know, those commercials for toothpaste where you, it's like four out of five dentists recommend this. If this is something that the toothpaste company is running, they have a vested interest in the types of results that happen. Or if you're doing a poll and the Democratic Party is running the poll, they have vested interests in trying to get results that are in favor of democratic ideals. It's because that, that party is paying for and funding the survey. And so there's kind of this, this uh, bias that's implicit in the way that the questions are asked and different things along those lines. If you are going to benefit from the results of the survey, you're going to try to be getting answers that are to your benefit. So a self-interest study is a convenience style of, ends up having that, you know, that convenience behind it. I'm going to be asking questions to the people and in a way that are going to get me the reply or the response that I want to get. Um, this is why those third party researchers are so important. So things like the, the, um, the Gallup polls or um, the Pew uh, surveys that, that go out. Um, these are, are reputed third party companies that are not vested in what the results are, right? They're separated from what's going on in terms of what the research is. Another type of bias is response bias. When we talk about response bias, this is just when the person being interviewed gives inaccurate responses. Inaccurate responses for any reason. So let's talk about um, and within response bias, one of the more common ones is something called a perceived lack of anonymity. If you're participating in a survey, you might be worried about people knowing who you are when they respond. So the responder or the person being interviewed is afraid of consequences from an honest answer. So let's think about some examples of this. Uh, perceived lack of anonymity. If you have a census worker coming to your house and asking if there are any illegal immigrants in the home, um, 
you might be afraid of revealing that there's illegal immigrants and having bad consequences of maybe uh, naturalization services showing up um, or things along that line. Uh, another example of perceived lack in, of anonymity, maybe you are in a, a high school class, you're sitting down and they give out a survey and they're asking, you know, do you do drugs? Do you have sex? And the teacher is wandering up and down the aisles. You're likely not going to be responding in a way that is completely accurate if you're afraid of your impression of what's going to happen. So this could be like a physical fear or it could just be I'm afraid of looking bad or um, or whatever in front of different groups. Anytime that you're afraid that there might be some sort of a consequence on the back end and you end up giving a response that's, that's not true. Um, other types of, there are really any type of place here where you're giving inaccurate responses um, will qualify under a more general response bias. Say, for example, uh, you agree to take a survey and you're 30 minutes into the survey and they start asking this really long question. Maybe you're just going to hurry things along. Let's kind of get going on this survey. Um, another example of uh, an, a type of a type of response bias is, let's say people ask your weight. Um, so a self-reporting of something like weight, number of times you go to the gym, how many times you ate out last week. Some of that might be just that you are rounding because it's close, or you, again, you may not want to have that impression. Um, a lot of times people will underreport their weight, or maybe they just report by rounding to the nearest five or 10. That's really common that you end up, if you're looking at a list of data, that you have in way more things that end in five and, and uh, zero than any other weight. That's just a natural response of how people give answers, but it does give something that is not 100% accurate. And so really the only way to avoid that would be to actually stop and take all of those weight measurements. Otherwise, you're going to be having some uh, variability that's in, that's built into the way that that, that, that uh, sample is being um, delivered. Another type of sampling bias by design is something called loaded questions. A loaded question is just where the uh, wording of the question of the survey is designed in a way to influence a particular answer. So for example, if you're thinking about a survey and one of the questions is, do you agree with the death penalty? And another question is, do you agree that we should, um, you know, kill kill criminals on death row when there's a possibility that they are innocent, right? And so all of a sudden you're you're guiding a particular answer in a particular way where you're doing that. Um, anytime that there's a highly um, controversial topic, I guess, you know, you're going to talk about abortion, you're going to talk about a lot of these uh, political motivations, uh, we end up with kind of loaded questions, depending on who is writing those surveys. And that's something that you want to avoid where your loaded questions, sometimes you call these leading questions. Something else that kind of fits into this category is the order of the questions that are being given. Uh, one of the more famous studies that's out there was a study where they um, they asked two questions for the people that they were interviewing. The first question was, are you happy? And the second question was, how many dates have you had in the last month? They did that to one group. And then for the next group that they talked to, they reversed the order of the question, where the first question was, how many dates have you been on the, in the last month? And then the second question was, how happy are you? way more negative responses to the happiness question in the second group when it was uh, kind of pre uh, kind of pre-led with them thinking about oh i haven't had that many dates you know I'm, I'm kind of in trouble or whatever in terms of my what i'm desiring for a relationship so uh this idea of the order that you ask questions in can also uh, be a type of bias in terms of leading people towards a particular response um, uh, 
The last special bias that we're going to talk about here is something called non-response bias. Non-response bias is when you have a high percentage of people refuse to participate in the study. If you've got lots of people refusing to participate, you're probably miss getting a group in terms of what they're what they're looking for. Um, maybe you pass out a survey to every student leaving the cafeteria and ask them to bring it back and put it in a box. Right, um, a high number of people are just going to throw that out and not reply at all. So. Um, Think things along those lines will give you non-response bias. And again, it's kind of like that voluntary response bias issue where you end up uh, really only ending up with kind of the more polarized answers instead of a better view of what everybody is thinking. So in all of these cases, somehow in the design of the way that that collection is happening, we're getting a non-representative group. And that is, the, so these are our, our different uh, subclasses of sampling bias. Anything else where you get uh, a non-representative group, we can just dub sampling bias. It's the big catch-all for everything. So, um, for example, if, uh, if a police officer is sitting in a squad car by the side of the road and measuring the speed of people that go by, they are much less likely to get an accurate response of the general behavior than maybe an unmarked car at the side of the road. Um, because people, what, whatever is going on influences people's behavior. Um, let's say that you are in a voting district and you only talk to people outside of the school. Well, you're going to be getting parents and their opinion, and you're going to miss a whole collection of other people that wouldn't respond. Uh, another example of sampling bias that's been a huge deal in the last just, you know, couple of decades is how frequently people, uh, a lot of surveys used to be done by calling home phone lines. And as more and more people switch to cell phone only, uh, if they only uh if they only had a landline approach to their survey, they were missing all the young people who were the ones more likely to have cell phones service only. This was a huge deal in a lot of the political polls where they missed, miscalculated the results because they thought that their phone survey would give a representative sample, but instead they missed all the young voters who had a big impact on the result um, in terms of uh, selecting a president that was different than the one that had been predicted. So again, if you have a survey where you're leaving groups of people out in one form or another, you have sampling bias and you're not collecting good data. And if you don't have good data, it doesn't matter what you do in terms of analysis, it's not going to be accurately reflecting what the population is representing. <clears throat> 